famous for many things, the sights and especially the smells. From the aromatic ingredients in its world-renowned cuisine to fragrant flowers that bloom almost everywhere. Now, thanks to one Bangkok company, anyone can enjoy the aromas without needing one of these, the passport. We'll tell you more later on in the show as we look at the ways Thailand is attracting Asia's business. Thailand's exporters, the homegrown companies showing the rest of the world that there is much more to this nation than meets the eye. We're here in Ayutthaya, north of Bangkok, to see how the past quarter of a century has seen a Thai family-run business become a leader in technology. Its chips are in things we use every day, possibly every hour iPhones, Blackberries and Samsung tablets are all set to be powered by HANA Microelectronics. Launched three decades ago in a small wooden house as a watch company with about 30 workers, HANA has grown into one of Asia's largest electronics firms with 1,100 employees and revenue of half a billion dollars. HANA has enjoyed a boost from users switching to high-tech products. Now it must ensure that trend continues. Uh, consumer electronics uh, is, are a large part of what we do and smartphones in particular have had great growth uh, over the past few years. Um, at the higher end now we do see uh, I, I think a more of a stabilization um, and you're seeing, you're seeing those in results coming through in terms of volume at least uh, from some of the leading brands. Where we believe we're going to see a better growth now are in lower cost smartphones because uh, the developing markets who also aspire to, to these products can't afford the six seven hundred dollar device but are happy to spend something to the region of half of that so if you're talking about developing markets are you then saying growth will mainly come from de developing markets in asia yes well it, that's where the developing markets are um china so india um southeast asia uh, um, that's where the consumer, that's where the demographics are, that's where the consumers are, but they don't have the spending power of the developed markets. You're currently high tech, but you're going into low tech. Where exactly will you be producing your low tech products? Okay, we're, we're going to venture into what I would call one of the frontier, remaining frontier markets, and that's Cambodia. It's going to be simple devices that, that require a lot of, uh, or a lot more labor input, because that is what Cambodia can offer. It's still a very immature, uh, uh, underdeveloped market and we need to uh, go slowly. How important is diversification in ensuring your survival? It's fundamental. We don't want to be um, totally reliant on any one particular industry or sector. So we're in medical, um, uh, consumer electronics, mobile, industrial, uh, um, so these are a broad, you know, automotive, these are a broad range of activities um, because every industry has a cycle, okay, and hopefully they don't go up and down at the same time, otherwise it's very difficult to manage. And so um, in order to keep, to keep our business moving uh, and, and, and not being totally affected by, a, by a, a cycle, either up or down, you need to be diverse. And having a, what we call low-tech um, electronic assembly operation in Cambodia is again another diversification. HANA Microelectronics has broadened its global network with operations in the US and China, but its core manufacturing facilities still remain in Thailand. Its Ayutthaya plant accounts for a third of its revenue. So what we're producing here, Haslinda, is we're taking silicon chips from our customers and then we are um, encapsulating them. It's a molding process to protect it because a chip is a very delicate device and any dust or dirt would cause a failure. This particular factory um, has the capacity to produce up to 15 million chips every single day of the year. We're probably producing about eight or nine at this point in time. Um, 
These machines are testing all the devices that we've assembled. We test every unit, 100% test for functionality uh, and quality. Uh, electronics is a, a quality obsessed industry. The time of the test depends on the device, but it can take between um, one or two seconds to a fraction of a second. And we're talking about devices that can be as small as um, half the width of your hair, and you can barely see it. So um, all the counting uh, and uh, moving the device through the manufacturing process is done with special equipment. Too big is a problem, too small is a problem. <laughs> Coming up, surviving the storm. The 2011 floods left Hana with no chips to sell, but crocodiles and snakes roaming the factory floor. Hana Microelectronics was among thousands of companies swarmed by Thailand's record floods in 2011. The disaster cost the economy about $45 billion and had a global impact, highlighting the country's growing importance as a manufacturing and exporting hub. Up until then, perhaps people didn't understand to what extent the supply chain uh, or how Thailand played a role in the supply chain. We supplied a, a lot of uh, parts to uh, um, uh, mobile phone companies um, and that became an issue as well and there are many other companies which um, were very dominant in their particular field and a major interruption to supply chain became a, became a problem. How bad was it? Give us a sense of what you had to go through. In the room we're standing in here, uh, the water was probably up to about this level. In fact, you can see a line here yeah, where, yeah. Where, one of the, where the water was. And uh, this, uh, in fact, this room was probably the most badly affected because, as you can see, this equipment is very heavy. It's about four or five tons each. We were not able to get them out in time and move it to higher ground. Well, overall, the approximate damage, um, and you can base that in terms of insurance claims, was in excess of 100 million US dollars. And is it true that when the flooding was occurring in those six weeks, you had crocodiles, snakes roaming about? Well, near, uh, near <laughs> Utia, there's a crocodile farm, which of course was a uh, jail breakout. <laughs> So um, it is true, uh, we saw crocodiles, snakes are everywhere in Thailand anyway, that's normal. And obviously, when there's a flood, the snakes have to find higher ground. So the place was infested and the water was basically like sewage. While the Thai government has pledged to invest more than $60 billion on infrastructure and water management projects, HANA is taking its own measures to limit the threat of future disasters. This is a, a, a flood wall which we have uh, assembled here, which w it's remaining here permanently as the second stage barrier. We have flood walls outside and our plan, should this ever happen again, is that this inner room containing that heavy equipment will be sealed and totally waterproof. The whole um, uh, flood protection uh, cost is about 1.3 million US dollars that we've installed here. Despite HANA struggling to get production back to pre-flood levels, the company continues to be a major player in global technology. We produce some extremely technically sophisticated devices. In this particular factory where we are today, we're, we're producing some of the smallest devices in the world that go into mobile handsets and other miniature devices. And it's very, very difficult and challenging to do that. It's been quite a journey for you because you were in a way forced into the industry. Um, you started off selling um, fake flowers, a business which you started. Artificial back, flowers. Artificial you flowers, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which you started back in school, mm -hmm. and you were asked to come back to help sell the family's business. Take us through some of the things that went through your mind when you were made to do that. Hannah was founded by my father, you know, who really had the vision about how. Um, electronic manufacturing uh, would start then and how it could develop. And together with the team of people that we have, we've gone through a very interesting, uh, sometimes stressful, many times enjoyable journey of developing this industry um, up. Uh, we're not the only ones in Thailand, of course, but uh, we've been perhaps one of the more successful ones in bringing HANA you know, um, to where it is today. 
The question really is, how do you take HANA to the next level? Well, you know, a number of companies in our sector um, have decided or have thought about making their own products because we make products for other people. Then we think, gosh, you know, this is a tough industry. Why don't we do this ourselves? Um, and that's a fundamental step, which we have at this point in time not chosen to go because it's fraught with danger and that's a whole new set of skill sets which we probably don't have a lot of experience in. There'll always be a need to manufacture a product, okay? And if you stick to something you know well, right, there's no reason why you can't do it. Coming up, from cutting edge technology to centuries old tradition, after the break, a look at a business exporting the very essence of Thailand. Welcome back. We continue our look at Thailand's exporters with a touch of indulgence. We're in Bangkok to visit a company harnessing the country's natural ingredients to create luxurious lotions and potions for the world to enjoy. Taking traditions global and giving them a modern twist. With outlets in more than 20 countries, lifestyle brand Han's unique blends and strategy have gained worldwide recognition by leveraging Thai heritage to attract an international audience. Um, Han philosophy is an Asian philosophy of a holistic approach. Um, when we look at the world, we are trying to restore the natural balance of the body, the mind, and the environment. So that's the core philosophy for the brand, but it's also the same philosophy we use to build and operate the company. The Asian-ness of your brand is very strong at a time when a lot of Asian brands actually want to be Western. Why is being Asian so important to you? I think by being honest about our origin and then try to highlight uh, the strength. You know, the knowledge have been passing through for generations and generations in China, uh, Japan, Thailand and India. These are all valuable lessons that we can apply to our products, uh, our brands, our design, virtually everything. Is it difficult to sell the story, the idea, the product? in the Western world? Um, no, I, think, I don't think so. I think it's even easier now that the whole world is now looking towards Asia, both financially and also for any trend setting or style. And I think it's becoming easier and easier for us every day. You're very much involved in all aspects of the business, including the mixing of the aromas. How do you do that? Take us through the process. Um, Basically, as a child, I grew up in my grandmother's kitchen. <laughs> I helped her make, you know, fresh curry paste every day. Uh, I learned about herbs, uh, their different scent, different properties. And, you know, that knowledge stuck with me until I started the business. I started to play around with different essentials, blending the essentials, and was able to create a very unique scents that even people in the perfumery industry uh, never thought of doing. Isn't it true that when you first started out in Thailand, there was no market to speak of? We have to create our own market by educating the consumers about what is unique about natural products. Why are they much better than the, what's available uh, commercially in the supermarket and why it's justifiable to pay a higher premium. How have you managed to change the perception of your customers? I think we have to offer the customer well beyond their expectations. Basically, it's not just the high quality product. Uh, it's the whole experience. experience, the whole shopping experience, how they can come to a beautiful store, uh, test different products, have a very well trained and knowledgeable uh, personal consultant to advise them on what product is appropriate for their needs. hand in all the designs of the packaging, the bottles, boxes and so on. Yes. I think that's part of the fun of the, the whole working <laughs> part on Han. And this is our newest uh, product. 
This one is called an Angel's Hands Angel's collection. Hands. So you get to test all the best-selling fragrances. Like this one is a jasmine hand cream. We are the only brand in the market that's using 100% natural jasmine essential oil. And this is the Simbo Pokan, which is my favorite. It's a blend of the lemongrass and lavender. You, I think. Yes. <laughs> this one is a scent that most people would not recognize. It's lemongrass, though. It's lemongrass and lavender. So it's a perfect blend. We call it like a Eurasian blend of the Asian mixes with the European. You've become a lifestyle brand. You've, you've ventured beyond just your lotions yes. and uh, your bars of soap. Mm -hmm. um, everything started from Han. So basically, Han is a natural body care and skin care and spa products. And then we branch into wood for the fragrance. And then we also have the Tisha, which is a certified organic herbal tea. Uh, it all started from the tea we serve in our spa. And now we are getting ready to open our first tea room in October in Chiang Mai. Is it difficult to remain Asian as you go global? I don't think so. I think it's, it's part of the charm. Because by being Asian, we are talking about anything from Japan, through China, through Thailand, through India, through Indonesia, uh, our inspirations for our product, for our brand. It's almost endless. Coming up, Han exports its exotic wares across the world, but there are still big markets it wants to crack. More than a decade of selling its fragrances across the world, Han has gained a loyal following, but the company faces some challenges as it ventures into new markets. You talk about going into the Chinese market. The question really is, why aren't you already in China? Uh, we have to be very cautious about the Chinese market. I've seen a lot of brands that enter uh, too quickly and get burned. Um, normally in a new uh, market where the customers are becoming wealthier, they tend to prefer you know, Europeans or American brands. That's why I was very cautious whether, even though they can afford it, are they sophisticated enough to trust a Thai brand? But from the past year that we have uh, kept tracks of the retail sales, both in Thailand and overseas shops uh, where the uh, Chinese tourists, they are purchasing, uh, we were very surprised that they are buying a lot. The risk of going into China is copies that your products will be replicated, and we've seen that happen for many brands. How do you hope to overcome such a problem? Um, I think if you're going to enter that very sensitive market like that, we need to create an impact the moment when we launch. So basically, we're not looking at opening a few shops in Shanghai or Beijing, but we're looking at opening maybe in 10 cities uh, within the first year, just to create the impact and awareness that we are the original, the authentic brand. You don't manufacture your products. They're outsourced. Yes, correct. Tell us more about that and, and why you came to that strategy. Uh, when we started, we were manufacturing and marketing as well. And I think we made the right decision that for us, our strength would be in the marketing. We are not a manufacturer. We cannot invest and set up um, an international level of factory. So we decided to focus on building the brand and doing the marketing. And at the same time, when we can outsource the manufacturing to a different manufacturer, uh, we can work with very talented R&D teams um, that can help us create very unique products for us. Would you say that one of the key reasons why you're successful, why your products are so popular, are the ingredients that you use in your products? Oh yes, we, we only use uh, natural active ingredients in our products. And we're actually quite innovative. We're the first one to use the 
water lily extracts uh, for skincare for its anti-aging properties. And it's now one of the best selling products in Japan for us. What exactly is being done in this particular warehouse? Okay, uh, this is our logistics center. We basically supply products to all our shops in Thailand, as well as uh, large shipments to our overseas distributors. Uh, we also do special packaging, uh, like what we have here is a special gift with purchase promotion item. Uh, we also do special gift sets as well, and also putting in uh, labels uh, for specific countries as well. This one in particular, body wash, Mm -hmm. Gift packages, they're yes. popular as gifts, aren't they? Oh yes, yes. Normally for the holiday season, we can look to about three times the normal volumes. We have shipments going to Japan, Vietnam, Indonesia, and you talked about China. In terms of growth, future growth, where will it come from? Um, I think mostly the growth will be in Asia. Aside from China, I think uh, Indonesia is growing very rapidly. Uh, we currently have eight shops and we plan to open about two more. Um, Philippines is also growing. Uh, we'll open our first shop in Philippines uh, next month at the Manila. As Han looks to expand globally, it'll have to mix the perfect blend of unique ingredients, attractive aromas and marketing magic to stand out as it takes Asian traditions across the globe. That's all for this episode of Thailand Attracts Asia's Business. Join us next time.